technology, I know my limits. So I get people I know that will definitely guide me in the right direction. The man you can see on here speaking is the one and only Ken Shamrock. Ape man, it says on his chest right now. That's a brand. But he is one of the original ape men. Um, we're from the same generation. He's someone who I have watched for years and years and years. Remarkably, I've, I've been in the same arenas as you, but we've never done an interview. And you fascinate me so much. You, you are genuinely of the old school. Genuinely of the old school. Yeah, there's definitely been a <clears throat> changing of guards when it comes to the kind of caliber of fighters. Now you have guys who are just so technical, so well-rounded. Um, but back in the day, man, there was just a lot of guys because there whole, wasn't a whole lot of skill sets because no one really understood or knew. that were just straight up tough, tough guys off the street that could just fight. And, and, and you... Because I want to go into your upbringing a little bit, because there's the, the, the legendary things about you that you you almost lived like a hobo at times, didn't you? You know? Um, yeah, I, you yeah, I didn't have, have a lot. So much from those days, Ken. So much. It almost it must almost feel too easy now. Do you know what I mean? In a weird way. Well, at times when, especially from where I came from. You know, there was just a struggle every day, which was just, uh, you were used to the grind. Like you knew when you got up that, you know, the only way that you get through the day was to, to not be standing still, you know, constantly be hustling and, and getting things done. Mm -hmm. And and then when you get to a point to where you start, you know, making it to the top of the mountain, it's almost like you have to stop and kind of pinch yourself because you got people doing things for you. You've got all this stuff around you. You have whatever you want at the fingertips. And sometimes you take advantage of that. Sometimes you almost become the person that you hate uh, because you're, you don't see that coming. And all of a sudden there you are and you look at yourself in the mirror and you're going, is that me? Uh, and so I think it was, I had to look at myself real hard in the mirror a couple times and say, you know what, this is not what I wanted to be. Uh, just because I uh, succeeded uh, doesn't mean that, um, you know, I'm better or, or, or that I should treat people um, any worse. So I think it was a couple of different times where I had to reevaluate where I was going and what I was doing. But that toughness inside of me was always there. It was, it had never changed. And when I walked into a ring to fight somebody, um, I fought. But the, also the same thing too, is I think a lot of people had a, a hard understanding with my principles that I wouldn't do something if I didn't think it was right either, because I also understood how I got to where I was at, was fine following the principles and the things that I believed in, not what someone else believed in. And so there was a lot of times in my career where I was asked or I was put in a position to have to do something that I thought uh, wasn't right. Uh, and so I had to stand up for that. And sometimes I got a bad reputation of being hard to work with. Um, or hard to deal with, but a lot of people didn't understand what was going on behind the scenes and the reason why I was acting that way. That's you're talking about will there, not arrogance, though. Right, right. Well, you talk about point, belief it, too. You know? You're talking about what you believe in too, um, right and wrong. And a lot of people look at me and go, "Well, you did all that stuff. Why would you stand up for something like that?" And I think it has a lot to do with the idea of like, listen, I had choices to make. And the choices I was going to make that were going to be in front of millions and millions of people were a lot different than the choices I was going to make when I was just with a few friends. Um, so I think that they're when it, helping people understand a little bit about that is, yeah, I wasn't perfect. And yeah, I did go out and I did a lot of things that probably wasn't the right way to do things. I got wild, you know, I got crazy. Uh, but I always had a conscience about what I was doing when it came to national TV and what people, little kids and, and kids growing up and idols and people looking at me, what I looked like on TV and how I was representing um, and what parents would see me representing. And so there was a lot of decisions that weren't probably uh, what my character was. I was pretty wild, I had fun, but when I was on TV and doing certain things and there was rules or different things that were laid down, I wasn't gonna break them just to break them or I wasn't gonna do something just to do it because now the whole world is watching. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, right now, well, thank God. And I feel about my own youth. Thank God there weren't camera phones around when we were in our phones. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because we got up to all kinds of shit. And I don't, there's nothing, 
and, and people will respond when they see this and say, well, what did you do? What did you do? Were you like, you know, mountains of cocaine? And <laughs> maybe not, but, but it's just, we, we knew how to have fun. You know, we did, we all look back in our 20s and go, did I really fucking do that? Do you know? Right. And I'm not talking about fighting. I'm on about doing pranks and right. like driving your car 300 miles to go to a rave. Do you know what I mean? And driving back after having had whatever you had there and having, not having slept for 90 hours or whatever it is. Do you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah. You yeah. You, I, I, I feel you because uh, yeah. we, especially when you're, when you're, uh, I felt like my adrenaline um, was so high yeah. because of the way uh, that I would fight because of the, the, the electricity I would get from the fans. I mean, there is just nothing that fills that spot you know, walking into an arena with thousands and thousands of people screaming and yelling and thousands of people watching on TV and, uh, and you walk out to go fight and, and the, the eruption that you get when you win, uh, you know, the, all of these adrenaline things, even training for a fight, you know, with the press and everybody's talking to you and want interviews. And so there's just so much of an adrenaline rush. And then you fight and all of a sudden there's that adrenaline dump. And so you get, you get yourself caught into going, well, I need to, I need to get, I need something need to, to fill that need emptiness. Rush afterwards. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So you get caught up into going and doing things that would almost try to fill that, that adrenaline or that rush that you had, that you just had a huge dump after your fight. Well, you know, it's funny because, you know, and you and I are the same. I mean, I'm a couple of years younger than you, but I, 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 I haven't fought, but I've had a lot of life force, life energy in me that in the end last year gave me a heart attack because uh, I lived too hard. So I had the same as Randy. I, I, I had a heart attack one night in bed, had to have a stent, but I know what it is. It's from hard living, not sleeping right. enough, um, the energy of 10 people, relentless, not b boasting that I didn't need any sleep. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. But you realize, it, but you realize right. like, having got to grandfatherhood, that you do need to sleep. You can't go traveling around the world all the time and party and drink tequila and smoke and work your nuts off and work for TV, radio, newspaper and not stop ever. You, your body says, hang on a minute, mate. You know, right. you, you might have the energy of 10 people, but you've got to look after the vessel you're in. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, for a fighter, right. and for a fighter, age is the factor, isn't it? And, and I wanted to ask you this because last week, Mike Tyson, after 15 years away, has announced he's coming back against Roy Jones Jr. on September the 12th. I looked this up, and obviously I remember it, but you were 51 when you fought Kimbo and 52 when you fought Hoyce Gracie. Should Mike Tyson be coming back? Absolutely. Um, I'm always a, a person that likes to stand behind people who have done so much for the sport, so much for the fans, and that when they have a choice to come and do something for fun or something they enjoy doing uh, or raising money for charity, um, absolutely, because that's who we are. I mean, it's not like when people go, well, you should just stop. It was like, well, when you're that great uh, and you've done so much to build something and that you're the face of that thing and then you carry that on even after you're out of retirement and you could come back and that you can entertain the fans or raise money for charity um, it's no different than someone going, okay, I'm going to retire from this job, but I'm going to go fishing now, or I'm going to go bowling, or I'm going to go do something that I want to enjoy life in. It's no different than what Mike Tyson or that I did later on in my career is that I don't want to go fishing and I don't want to go hunting. I want to fight for fun. I enjoy it. I enjoy making the fans pop. I enjoy being in front of them doing interviews. These are all things that I enjoy. So why would I stop something? that I enjoy doing. And this is what I have a hard time for people to understand because they go, well, if you'd have just stopped, you would have been 27 and, and four at, rather than 20, 27 or 28 and 15 or something like that. Well, because you and went like, 16, four and, four and 12, didn't you? Yes. But and that doesn't so, diminish the legacy in any way in, as far as I'm concerned. No, but you hear people saying it just kind of hurt. And it may have, but what I want them to understand is, is that I enjoy my life. I enjoyed going out and competing and challenging myself, even though I knew I wasn't going to go out and be my best, but I enjoyed it. And so if you're living life and you're thinking about, you know, as you get older and you want to do things that you want to enjoy doing, 
because I enjoy fighting and, and training and the camaraderie and all the things that go into that, all of a sudden they want to take that away from me. And it's like, well, now you're taking away my retirement because I don't have to win. I'm not ranked. I'm not in that situation where I'm, now I do it because I want to have fun. Now Mike Tyson's coming back, but he's doing it to raise money for charity. So why wouldn't he come back on something that people, I, I'm excited to see the guy. I'm excited to see him go in there and, and throw some punches. Um, and so, and I think millions and millions of other people are the same way. They're excited to see Mike Tyson come back. We don't care how old he is, man. He's an idol. I'm the same. I mean, I had to write a column in the Daily Telegraph newspaper that I've worked for for a very long time, 27 years. And they were like, the editors were saying, it's bad for boxing. I said, no, you shouldn't. I, it, technically, as a, as a journo, he shouldn't be coming back but I will be watching. There's no question <laughs> about it. So will millions of others, because when he busted those moves in the pandemic uh, <laughs> coronavirus lockdown, you thought, oh yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing a bit of that. He's teamed up, or I say teamed up, they've signed up Roy Jones Jr., who, if that fight had been made 20 years ago, and it was talked about, it would have been an amazing thing. And amazing. some people think that 20 years ago, Roy Jones Jr. might have beaten him. I don't agree, but... He was the baddest man on the planet. <laughs> you were the world's most dangerous man. Are you still the world's most dangerous man, really? Well, yeah, I am in a sense that if you mess with my family, um, I will be very dangerous, definitely. Um, but at the same time, I also understand my limitations. You know, I mean, I've got bad knees. I've got, you know, back injuries, this and that. I'm out there doing pro wrestling. I'm enjoying myself. But I don't want people to think for a moment, if, if, if I was pushed into a corner, man, I'm coming out, man. I'll be a lion, definitely. You won't get anything less than everything. So um, I will always be, I don't care if I'm in a wheelchair. If somebody ever does anything, I will <laughs> always try to fight them. Slinging them. You'll be pulling off oh. the wheels and taking some. <laughs> I'll just roll on the ground and do a leg lock. Because <laughs> your ground game's got better and better and better as you've got older. Yeah, it's but I don't move as well. So I literally when I go for something, I've got one or two shots at it. Because I don't I, my my worst part is the transition from the ground to standing up. <laughs> on the ground, I'm fine. I can roll on the ground, right? But it's that transition getting up and down. That's where I struggle. Quick quickly, you mean, I suppose yes. you can get up, but you're a bit like the QE2 Titanic turning. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, just give me the ropes or the cage. <laughs> I'm, I, I, got, I mean, I, there's so many questions I've got for you. Can I ask you whether it was cathartic doing the book with Jonathan Snowden? Because it's been really, annoyingly, it came out during the coronavirus lockdown, didn't it? So you couldn't do a tour, which I hope you are going to do with him at some point. But was that cathartic doing the book? Well, you know, I know every time that, uh, and my wife was really a big component of keeping me grounded. Every time that I had to go into stories and, and go back to that time in my life, I would get depressed. Um, so she would tell me when she started seeing me kind of take that nosedive um, because uh, I went through some pretty rough stuff and uh, I did a lot of things to try to cover the pain, uh, you know, whether it be drugs or an alcohol or, or fighting or whatever it was. I did a lot to try to, to cover up all the pain that I felt. And so it, it would bring me back to that time and I would start getting depressed and she would try to give me that nudge like, hey, you need to get grounded again and step away, like step away for a moment and, and mm. figure out what's happening to you back up and, and regain yourself. So there was a lot of times where um, that, those are things that I had to deal with. And, and I think Jonathan uh, took some brunts of that because <laughs> I, was, I was angry because I... I'm reading things that I don't want to read, yeah. you know? Um, but I also, at the same time, I wanted that out, but it's a lot different when you get it out and you're reading it and you see it, than it is you wanting it out. And the reason why I wanted it out was because I wanted to be able to have a book that wasn't a Joe Canseco book or all these other people that write their thing and it's their story and they're telling it, but yet they throw everybody else under the bus, not themselves. It wasn't their fault. Um, so I wanted this to be real. So um, Jonathan took a, a, a real 
interest in writing it. He did a lot of work on it. Um, you know, the only part is I just wish that um, we would have uh, at least talked about the release of the book. I didn't even know it was out. I haven't even got a copy myself yet. Um, so uh, it, it just kind of, it just felt like it was rushed. Um, and then when I asked Jonathan, like, hey, what's the, you know, I heard the book was out. And he said, yeah, I just want to get it out. People are sitting around and, you know, they need things to read. So I kind of understand that he was trying to get it out so people would buy the books because now everybody's sitting around and was going to a job. So it'd be a good time for people to read. So I understood that part. Of it, but I just felt like, you know, um, you know, where was my copy? <laughs> you know, no. signed by you, Jonathan. <laughs> I want my copy signed by you. No. Uh, and, and I never got a copy of it. I never got to proofread it uh, to make sure that uh, everything was correct. But, you know, I mean, when you talk about the work that Jonathan put in and the, the, as many people, because I had, you know, 40, 50, 60 people calling me saying, hey, Ken, this guy wants to talk to me about these, this, this, these things. He says, are you, I said, tell him the truth. I said, this is a book. I want it to be real, be real. And they were like, are you sure? And I was like, yes, I want it real. So um, it was, it was, it was, I knew what I was getting into, mm. but when the book was released, it's different than reading it. But I really appreciated it. I really do, because I think that, it's going to, ch I hope it changes the way people look at these different celebrities that are writing books and they always come out smelling like a rose because that is not the truth. We are not angels. That I think what, because you can't see yourself from the outside and I've interviewed many people over a long period of time. I have a very deep respect and I'm kind of like a historian on fight sports and I like to go deep with people as you can see, but the authenticity of you, you are so authentic anyway. And I think it's very interesting to hear you say that you're comfortably numb because, but what this did was open your vulnerabilities again, you know? And, but the point being, you will have grown through being vulnerable doing it as well, especially at our age where we are grown ups. Men in their 50s are proper, like you pick your battles now. You, you pick your battles, whereas before you'd have battled everybody. You did. <laughs> yeah. No, but you yeah. do, don't you? You kind of, you can see, you can see the fucking battle coming now from over there. And you just go, Shh. and but you just do that at this age. You don't when you're in your 20s because, because you're a dick then. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. When looking back on it, not you, but one is. Do you know what I mean? No, I, but, but I understand what you're saying. Yeah, we, we are though, we, but we don't see us that way. No, exactly. When so, it, you're like, so, wow, why was I like that? So like, I, I, like, I'm close with Tyson Fury and I've been close to him a long time, you know, and, and throughout the whole of his career. And I, I have the trust to go into his dressing room before he fights. And I go into his training mansion in Vegas before he fights. And it's been great to see this huge gypsy traveler come open about his mental health issues like they are the toughest family you'll ever meet right. but this is this big rough tough guy who shouldn't talk about his mental health issues but he's talking about them and in that way that's what i like about you staying authentic and your story being out because it'll be a hollywood movie one day the wrestler could have been written for you do you know what i mean right. See right. The movie with mickey Rourke. Yeah. That yeah. could have been written for you from the, from the cadence to the bottom, to the climb, to the top, to the fall again, to the climb. And you've, the amazing thing about you though, as well, you knew about showmanship early because you've transitioned between pro wrestling and real fighting. And both are athletic and artistic. One is more artistic than the other. One is more athletic, I believe. Um, or certainly mentally more athletic. Right. Um, where did you get all that from, that showmanship? How did you know about that? <clears throat> I think it's just kind of my, my DNA and my character. Um, and I think it's a lot to do with, too, is that I'm one of those people that would look at something and I will break it down. Like, why does it work? Like, I'll see a leg lock. Uh, a heel hook was the first thing I learned because it got it put on me. And I was like, that hurt. And so immediately, because it hurt me, I was like, that's the thing that stuck in my mind. So I learned it first and I learned it so easy. I just saw it and I broke it down. And then I also, when I went into doing the wrestling, which I wrestled first, 
uh, when I went into pro wrestling, the one thing I noticed, the same kind of thing was I was doing all these bumps and I, I was very athletic. I could just do them, right? Because I could look at it and just do it. Just do it, yeah. Yeah, and like so when I looked at vault. it. You could do pole vaults if you had to. Yeah, I, yeah. Did. I did. I did that in high school where I actually yeah, went exactly. out to the pole vault and yeah. I just did yeah. it. Yeah. But I would always watch something and I would look at the leverage of it. I would look how it how it happens. And I did the same thing with wrestling. When I watched wrestling, I was like, well, what makes one guy different than the other? And it was character. It was being able to get your character, your personality out there because everybody can do a hip toss. Everybody can do a body slam, but it's how you do it and what you do after that with the selling part of it, with the character part of it. That's what puts you over more than anyone else. And so I looked at that and I caught on right away that if I could sell, if I could literally get people to believe what they're doing to me, then when I do something, it becomes a much bigger thing rather than me just going through these moves and, and not selling these things. So that's the first thing I learned was how to sell. I was like, man, I could get a match over just selling and then making one big move and people would pop. And I learned that early on. And I try to get young wrestlers now to, as they try to all have these different characters and styles. And I said, you know, the biggest thing in wrestling to get you over is to learn how to sell. Because if you can sell, that means everything you do off a of sell is gonna pop. Well, if you can, you can, there's two characters that come to mind when I think about that. And like the Shamrock name, they're both Irish. The man, as she's called, look yeah. what she's done. Look what she, I'm a huge fan of hers. Yep. And I'm a fan of like genuinely boxing and MMA more than pro wrestling. But, and Conor McGregor, he could be, I remember setting with Triple H in Madison Square Garden, having a chat with him. And McGregor, McGregor was, no, it wasn't McGregor. Yeah, it was McGregor. It was the night he knocked out um, uh, Eddie Alvarez to win two yeah. UFC titles, to, to begin, win the lightweight title after being the featherweight champion. And I sat with him and had a chat. And I've got the hair he used to have, and because he, he's got none <laughs> now. And Triple H said to me, I'd sign him at 175 pounds like that. Because they've got that, haven't they? They've yeah. got that yeah. thing. Half the people hate them. Half the people love them. But they're all tuning in. Yep, that's it's, it. You, you can't, people are born like that. It's, it's the lunatic in the crowd of us that's always funny when we're out, who maybe causes the trouble. They've got that, they've got that thing, haven't they? Well, what bothers, what, well, it doesn't bother me, but it, it, it's kind of a, it, well, I guess it bothers me in a way because when you look at the way that the UFC has gone and how it's been built, and then you have people that are in the power of position say that they don't want guys to be pushing each other or you know jumping on all these things and he doesn't like that part well that's what built the ufc correct because i was the first one to do it i was the first one that set it up with hoist then with kimbo chemo then with dan severin it was all about the character it was all about the stuff that i brought up to make the fans want to watch my fight and not anybody else's and then you have some people that will go, well, yeah, man, if you're good, people will watch. Well, no, they Not will, true. but they won't remember you when you're done. The difference, the difference, Ken, is it becomes a trade fight rather than a mainstream fight. Do you right. know what I mean? It yes. doesn't cross over. And it's all about crossing over, isn't it? We want to create more fans. We want it to be a showpiece the whole time. That's why I never had any issue with Floyd Mayweather against Conor McGregor. In fact, I was interviewing McGregor for TV and I said, yep. and I'd just done a Mayweather pay-per-view. I said, you know, there's a billion dollar fight there for you, don't you? He said, show me the money, Garrett. Show me the yep. money. Because, because they are both, it was always going to be a marketing explosion with those two, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. You talk about two guys with just this huge characters. Yeah. And now they were going to come to fight each other. And, yeah. and Connor stepped into boxing to fight him. And so, in my opinion, Mayweather, even though he's still popular and always will be and made a lot of money, but Mayweather is the one that got everybody's respect because he stepped in and fought him. Now it's time to turn the pages and have, uh, and this would be a huge money fight for Mayweather to step in and fight Connor in MMA. Uh -huh. well, but he won't, he won't do it. Well well, that's, again, that's, that's a part of his psyche, the ego of his psyche, because he's going to take a whooping, yeah? He's got to, right? He's not going to win. Right. Just like Conor McGregor, though. Well, I th well, 
as you know, because you've done all the disciplines, it's easier to control your opponent in boxing because it's yes. a single martial yeah. art. Yeah. Um, I'd love to see it. again. It would make half a billion dollars that fight, wouldn't it? You know, yeah, you but, know but, it would. You know, but but here's the thing too. It's like when those two fought, and, I, and, and people could say whatever they want to say, but that was an exhibition fight. If Mayweather wanted to take him out in the first round, he would have taken him out in the first round. Right. But he turned it into a great, a great exhibition fight. I loved it. But now Conor McGregor has the same, same – he could do the same thing for Mayweather. He could turn because he's that good and Mayweather's that athletic that if they get into this where it's an MMA one, that he would be able to carry him for at least one to two rounds to make it fun. He could even take a shot, go down. I'm telling you. Conor McGregor has the character, the personality to carry Mayweather two to three rounds in an MMA fight, just like Mayweather carried Conor in a boxing yep. match. Yep. That's why I don't know why he wouldn't do it because he's going to take care of him just as he took care of Conor. Conor will take care of him. But everybody wants to see it. So we, Can we always say this in our sport? Never say never, yeah? Right. Never say never. Right. And, and I <laughs> right. think it will happen. It, but I hope so. probably need a crowd for it. Um, let me ask you, um, it's such a pleasure to speak to you, my friend. Really, it's such a pleasure for me. I'm humming. I am humming. Um, <laughs> um, how has lockdown, pandemic lockdown been for you, or shelter in place, or, or, or however you're calling it over there? How has how's the coronavirus panic? Because, you know, we're in our 50s. We've never been through anything like this in our lifetime. Uh, we? It's, it's crazy because, like, you know, one day we're all moving and, and, and having a good time. And then, you know, a week later, we're like, we're all going, what happened? And so it's a struggle right now. I mean, there's a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, a lot of uncertainty. And I think right now the countries, I think all countries are very volatile right now. Uh, and, it, and I think it all started with, um, you know, the coronavirus, I think there's a lot of underlying issues that are happening while the coronavirus is being done. We could talk about that all day long about the political part of it and all that other stuff. But really, it's about right now how the people are, 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 are allowing themselves to be led, um, allowing themselves to be led to the edge of the cliff. Uh, and then you've got people pushing each other, to, uh, whether they're going to push you over or hold you. Um, but now we're all fighting. And it seems like there's no stop to it. And it's just, man, if you could just take a step back and just breathe and, be and realize. And be informed. Yes. Yeah. Like, just relax. Don't allow yourself to be led down a road that you can't see the end. And that's what's happening is we're being led down this road with promises that have, at least in my lifetime, have never been, been kept when it comes to the political stuff, even presidencies where promises have been made, they've never been capped. So why are we all constantly keep going down that same road blindly? Uh, so anyways, I, I just feel like now with the coronavirus and everything that's happening, I try to, I'm trying to separate myself from all of that, uh, but also still have a word through social media, uh, through different channels that I have to be positive. Yeah. And I know even myself, when I've tried to stay positive in a couple of different ways where I would post something, people take it completely out of context. Like they'll see it and they'll go, well, what did that guy deserve to get it? Well, hold up. All I'm trying to show you is that the world is in a violent place right now, not one side or the other. I'm not making an agenda here. I'm just showing you, let's all take a breath, take a step back and give each other a hug instead of fight one another. Yeah. Because right now is where we all need one another. Now is the most important time where we can, Republican, Democrat, whatever you, whatever race you're, whatever you are, whatever you stand for, stop and just hug one another and come together because that's the only way we're going to survive this. One of the things that I've thought about a lot, and I've, I've been in lockdown, I live in the countryside, about 30 miles north of London. And I, you know, I'm a grandfather. I've only seen my grandson yeah. twice and my daughters a couple of times. Um, and I haven't posted a lot on my social media about the political, the Black Lives Matters or, or Trump or the coronavirus, mainly because I've been trying to sit back 
you know, I consider myself a very educated person. I'm comfortably numb in my own surroundings. I'm listening to a lot of Pink Floyd and Led yeah. Zeppelin and all that. <laughs> there you go. Um, but, 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 you know, exercising a lot, but also just trying to take stock. And I, one of the things that, correct me if I'm wrong on this, I've spoken to a lot of, I've got friends of all colour in, in our industry and in the industries that I work. And my feeling is that even though there is institutionalized racism, it's going to take a generation to sort it out, or right. maybe two generations. I've, my feeling is in fight sports, we don't deal with racism a lot. That's no, my no. feeling. I may be wrong, but that's my feeling. We don't because we beat each other up. It's like <laughs> you, you, no matter what you, no matter what you feel or what you think outside of the ring, when you step in the ring, you're fighting another human being. It's I don't care. Yeah. yeah, and if you get your butt handed to you, you're gonna respect that person. Mm -hmm. If you beat him up, once you're done, you're gonna respect that person because you stepped in the ring, you fought one another. You don't see anything in there but another competitor, another person trying to take your position, and you're defending that. Nothing else matters. And to me, that is the most purest place to be. Can I add to that? I think that women are treated very well in MMA as well. Oh, yeah. So well in boxing, it's got a long way to go. It's much more Macrostian. They're Luddites about women still, even though it's improving. Right. But my experience and what I see is that women in MMA, it's quite advanced MMA in terms of societally. There is great acceptance because people... Every great coach I speak to, from your Whitmans to your Rufuses to your, 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 your Mendezes, your Javier Mendes, to your Winkle Johns, to your Jacksons, to your Gibsons, to your Mike Browns, they're all about the betterment of people, you know, as well as making them better fighters. And I do think we get that Conan Silvera, another one. You know all these guys anyway. Yeah. Um, and I do think we can be proud of what our community is. Yes. Yeah, we need to just basically just take just take, take a step back and understand that, you know, we're all privileged, all of us, because we live in the United States of America, right? I don't, you could spin it, you could say whatever you want to say about it, but when you look at it, where else would you want to be? I mean, you're living in the UK. Oh, it's where great. Else, where else would you want to be? That's what I'm saying. We are all privileged to be where we are at. Whether you live in the UK, whether you live in the United States, whether you live in Ireland, you're living and you are privileged. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people out there that are not privileged because they don't have the income. They don't have the job. They're struggling. So I just say, take a step back, man, and really think about what it is when you see something and you call somebody privileged. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Right. So for me, I just love where where um, my mind is at right now. And I'm hoping by doing and I'm doing a podcast. Uh, if you want to check it out, it's kinshamrock.com forward slash podcast. Kinshamrock forward slash podcast. Who if you, you want to check it out. Now? What's that? Who are you doing it with? Uh, it's I believe it's multimedia. Uh, no, but who's, who, have you got a, have you got like a. Uh, uh, a moderator or a, or a presenter with you? Yeah, Steve Gersh is the ones behind the scenes with me who works for Oh, it's Steve, yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. I mean, we got, I mean, it's an awesome, we've got all the setup and it's, it's way beyond my thought process, but um, I'm very, very blessed. But I, like I said, I, I think even having the podcast and being able to uh, talk with people, have an outlet, uh, they can actually ask questions with me, you know, if they want to talk to me or, or even have a topic suggestion they want me to talk about. Um, I'm always open to that. So we always have channels for them to do that. Um, so I want to engage. And that's, that's why I started that was because I wanted to, to try to at least try to be a part of making, making things good. Um, and not all the time. Sometimes I say the wrong things as we all do. And Sometimes I don't think the right thing, you know, as we all do, but that's why I have engagements with my fans because I'm always willing to listen. Tell me why I shouldn't think that. Tell me why I shouldn't do that. Give me reasons why. Don't just tell me to do it because that's what's happening to everybody right now. We're just being told to do something, but give me a reason why. And we can come to that agreement. I want that. 
Well, the great philosophers, and I would hope to do this in my life as I get older, and I'm sure you'll concur, is that the great philosophers say the older you get, the more liberal you ought to become, not the more conservative you ought to become. And in that way, you stay in touch with the younger generations below you. It's the only way we can stay in touch. And I think that's what you're talking about, you know. Well, we, and we get, let's just face it, as we live, you know, we, 50, 50 plus years old, we learn a lot. We've done a lot of things. We've been on bottom. We've been in the middle. We've been on top. So we've experienced a lot of things and we we're, know how they turn out. We're whole, but we're full of holes. Exactly. Because <laughs> we'll be able to explain what someone's doing going, this is where you're going to end up, right? And whether they want to listen to you or not, that's up to them. But we were pretty, we have a pretty good idea because we, we started there and we ended here, but we recovered. <laughs> we're still going, basically. <laughs> Yeah, we're still recovering. <laughs> I'm constantly, every single day, always trying to always be better, always try to um, engage and try to, to learn more, understand more. Over 25 years, three fights with Hoist Gracie, yeah, who I see frequently because I, I work on, I've got, I work for Channel 5 over here on the Bellator events that come here. And I have worked on the UFC in the past for, for, for the broadcasters here as well. Um, do you two still bump into each other? And obviously, it must irritate you that you're one draw, two losses in that one. And I know what Hoist is like. He, 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 he's, he's a wind-up merchant, isn't he? You know? Yeah. What happens when you and he roll into each other these days? Like I've always said, I'm a respectful person. You know, I don't have to agree with um, his thoughts and, and some of the things that he's, he talks about. But I'm not going to be that guy that I hate, and which is being a guy that's frustrated and angry about things that happen that I can't change. Um, when I talk about them, I always break things down. I explain them. I have no problem um, talking with people or even debating people uh, on it. But when I'm with him, I'm going to show him with respect. I'm going to show him respect because that's that's just who I am. Um, I'm not going to turn around and do something that I dislike. No, because the thing is, though, you, I mean, you're a Hall of Famer. He's a Hall of Famer. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I right. mean, you know, you've created an industry for thousands of people. And yeah. there wasn't an industry there when you guys were doing it. It was an experiment, wasn't it? It was. It really was. And, you know, the, and, and I always want to make sure that I give respect with respects to. Hoist won four UFCs. And he was 180, 185 pounds. Still is. He still is. I get on yes. the show. He's still 185 pounds. Can, I mean, just think about that. And the day that we were going, right, where it's like these, these monsters came in there. And I was, I was 200. I was 199, 198. So we were going in there and fighting guys who were 250, 260. So the, that, that people visualizing that, it changed the world on what people thought about combat sports. Because you see a boxer like that, you don't see that happening. He's a big guy, knocks somebody out, right? You see the big guy is always the one that's going to destroy somebody. But it changed it. You know, when the Gracies came in and put the UFC in, they changed what we know today as combat sports and how it works. So, I mean, I have never um, denied what he has done and what his capabilities are. Um, you know, you think about me when I went into it, man. I mean, I was I – was, I had two, I, I wrestled two years in high school. Um, I had no boxing experience. I had no karate experience. I had zero in combat other than street fighting. And in two and a half years, I became the world champion in Japan and the world champion in the UFC. Two and a half years after I became a pro, as opposed to he was 20 something years, I guess, that, and 45 and one or something like crazy like that. Um, and won four UFCs. And here I am walking into the ring doing a super fight against a guy who is completely dominating in, 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 the, in that experience and category. I had no shot, zero shot to win because I did not have the experience that he had. But because of the way I looked, you know, and how, how athletic I was and how I learned so fast, people never realized that I was the underdog. I literally had no capability of working the guard, breaking the guard, understanding how to defeat the guard, none of it. I had to learn that on the fly. So 
it was, it was an exciting time for me because I had everything in front of me. Like I was learning as I was fighting and as I was winning championships, uh, I didn't have a black belt in anything. I wasn't, you know, a boxing champion. I wasn't a wrestling champ. I was two years in high school. Wrestling was my experience. Two and a half years, man, I'm standing on top of the world. There and weren't, so, yeah, there weren't YouTube clips in those days to learn things, were there? No, yeah. there was nowhere to train nothing. at. There was nothing. You yeah. walk into a gym and go, listen, you got a boxer. I'm going to shoot, take him down. They would look at you like you would kick you out of the gym. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was crazy, man. <laughs> um, you, you, you touched on Con Conor McGregor. I wanted to ask you about a couple of characters in fight sports right now. You touched on Conor McGregor um, and spoke more about Floyd Mayweather there in a way. Conor's done some pretty outrageous things. I imagine when you watch it, like the dolly through the window of the past. And the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the, well, from everything. I was there on the night in the Bellator event when he leapt into the cage to, to you know, he fought with the referee, Mark Goddard, and he only went in there to embrace his mate, Charlie Ward. Um, do you see yourself when he's doing all of that? Yeah, because, uh, you know, I did it with Tito, you know. Yeah. Um, I didn't quite go past the line, you know, of jumping in and fighting with the referee or throwing it through a window, but I have beyond be behind the scenes. So, uh, unfortunately, you know, in, in their world today, they catch everything, you know? Um, so, but listen, Conor McGregor is Conor McGregor. He, uh, the thing that amazes me the most, well, uh, and I think, and I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think he was nine and two, yeah, when he came Total in, he in UFC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nine and two. Yeah. Think about that for a minute. Nine and two. And this guy arguably is the best and the most well-known MMA fighter of all time. And he was nine and two. Yeah. Think about that. That's amazing. Yeah. That's all character. That's all personality. Has nothing to do, even though he was great. Uh, but it has nothing to do with wins and losses. It had to do with character. Because you look at the character, there's no – how many guys have fought out there um, that had, you know, is there 20 and 2 or 15 and 3 or whatever? They have so many, so much more experience in, in that ring. But Carter was such a polarizing figure that within a short period of time, this guy became the most popular fighter in MMA history. No, it's remarkable. And I think – you know, I don't know if you know this, but even before the nine and two, not if you go back a little bit further, he was picking up welfare payments because he he was a trainee plumber, you know, and and it, you know, I I mean I covered his rise very closely both on television and the newspaper here, and did two documentaries on him for the TV station here, and he is an extraordinary character. The self, yes, he is. You, you you've talked about it in yourself. The self-belief to be able to talk the talk and then walk the walk as well. Like, we all thought he was crazy taking the Nate Diaz rematch, <laughs> but he did it. But right, he did it. Right, like, yeah, there were, yeah. you know, when you get into the nuance and the reads, you find out that there wasn't that much notice for the guy. And, but, but the self-belief, the, 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 you know, the Blarney Stone, we always say about Conor McGregor, I've had said several times, he didn't kiss the Blarney Stone, he swallowed it. He's got yep. the gift of the gap, the complete gift of the gap. And the thing about characters like that is that um, you're not looking to, to go around anything. You're looking to be the greatest fighter of all time. You don't want any doubt. If you get beat by somebody, even though it was a short notice or they're a weight class out of yours, and I'm the same way. It's like, and that's what I did with Hoyce. I didn't want anybody but Hoyce. I wouldn't fight anybody in the finals because I wanted Hoyce. And when you get beat by somebody, Conor McGregor had the same mentality as like, I don't care. I can beat him. I want him. And that he wasn't going to go around. He wasn't going to sidestep. He wasn't going to make excuses. He was just going to go in and beat him. And he did it. And that's what the mentality of fighters like that. And Diaz is the same way. Oh, yeah. Is that you're not going to go around anybody that you know that you can beat. You are going to say, I want that guy. He beat me, but I can beat him. And you're going to go get him, and nothing's going to get in your way. And that's why you see Conor McGregor and these kinds of fighters 
will always achieve success because they're always going to have confidence and they're going to train hard. They're going to go second to nobody and nothing is going to stop. Nothing in their mind, yeah. nothing in their training is going to stop them from succeeding. Two things I always remember about him was that interview where I, well, three things really. I'm not one of four. I had an argument with him when I was doing the documentary and because I said, you know, you're the, re the, you're the interim champion. Before he fought Jose Aldo. <laughs> what interim? Don't, yeah. Yeah, walking interim out of here. I'm not the interim. Like, the, it was brilliant. We went back and forth. And, back, and right. uh, he believed himself to be the champion. Just before he fought Jose Aldo, myself and uh, I don't know if you ever met him, uh, he was an LA Times journalist, Lance Pugmire, who was around in fight oh, sports for a long time. He's a good yeah. friend of mine. We managed to sneak behind the curtain after the weigh ins, and we got two minutes with Connor. And it was before the Jose Aldo fight. And I've got it on tape. And he told us exactly what he was going to do. That he was going to ghost yep. him, slide in, and just knock him out with the left hand. And he did it in whatever it was, 13 or 14. He did exactly yeah. that. He had it in his head. And yeah. you know because you've done that. And yeah. again, and also then with the Eddie Alvarez fight in New York, at Madison Square Garden, one of the first UFC events there, his left hand just... Knocking out Eddie Alvarez, like, and Eddie Alvarez was one of the toughest guys yes. we've ever seen in a, in a cage. Yep. So those moments stay with you, you know, because there's nothing like, and you you experience that slowing down, that adrenaline, that walk to the Colosseum. You're you're an ancient gladiator in Rome. You're all those things in that moment. And you don't see anything but your hand being raised. You know you're going to win. There's no doubt in your mind. This guy can't beat you. Yeah, yeah. You know it. And that's where I think a lot of fighters, at least there's only probably about 1% of the fighters that have the ability to literally walk in there and see the finish, know how it's going to end, and then go do it. Um, John Jones, the greatest of all time in ability or not? I think he's in the, definitely in the conversation. Absolutely. Um, he's an amazing... Uh, it's just crazy on how he's able to just walk in and fight and just literally not miss a beat. Uh, you know, I remember there's times where I had done that, where I had just gone in, especially in training, where they would say, hey, uh, you got to fight Dwayne Kozlowski to see, you know, which one of you guys is going to go over. This was back in the uh, uh, UWF day. And, and I just threw on my shoes and did it. And this guy was in a, in a goal or an Olympic uh, qualifier in Greco-Roman. Uh, and I just went in and did it. And so I think there's very few people that have the ability to be able to just walk in and just dominate somebody. And I think Jones is one of those guys where he doesn't need anything other than his mind yeah. because he has all the skills. He's always in shape. Even though he may look out of shape, he's always in shape. And he can walk in and just fight. And, um, and I think that was the old school mentality when, when the earlier fighters – I used to fight because you didn't know who you were going to fight next. You didn't know how many times you were going to fight. You didn't know how many injuries you would have going into something. But you just turned it on autopilot and you went. And I think John Jones is a lot like the old school fighters. Do you, do you agree that Anderson Silva, George St. Pierre, Randy Couture, Tito Ortiz, yourself, is that the Mount Rushmore really? Do we add Khabib Nurmagomedov in there now as well? Well, I think, I think Khabib's there for sure. I think Connor's there. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys, man, that you look at these generations of fighters that literally put the UFC on their backs and, uh, and carried the organization for months or years. Um, those are guys that I think that, you know, all have the, uh, should be recognized as, you know, and I don't think there's just four of them. I think there's, there's many, many of them. And I think oh, they all should be recognized. Um, on boxing, have you taken an interest in my mate, the Gypsy King, Tyson Fury? I think he's tremendous, man. I, I think his, his style of fighting is good for boxing. Um, he's a go. He's coming to get you. Uh, and for being a big dude, man, you very rarely see that. A lot of he's big, big dudes. Big. He's big. 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 Six but nine. he's, a, but Six he's nine. aggressive, right? I mean, he's going to come fight you. Usually you get somebody that, that big, they're going to use their reach. They're going to use uppercuts. They're going to keep you at a distance. Now he, he's coming to get you. He's an aggressive fighter. I'm a fan. Of I, think he's, I think he's great for boxing. Yeah, because, well, he, he really used that style again. Did you see the Deontay Wilder fight the last Oh, time? my goodness, yeah. You know? Yeah. But again, it's, he predicted what he was going to do. <laughs> yeah. And he went yeah. out and did it. You I'm know? telling you, it's that photograph memory. You predict it. 
you know how it's going to happen through your training and all that. And you just know, I mean, I've been in several fights like Conor McGregor, Jones, a lot of guys who are in that 1% could just see it happening. And then you go in for whatever reason, you know how it's going to unfold because of the way they fight. And so you go in and fight and you already see it happening. And that's why when you walk in, you're so confident that you're going to win because you know how the fight's going to go. Um, is it really important as I kind of close down my, I'm, I'm heading down the hill now in the final questions because I'll keep you all night. Uh, um, cause it's, it's fa fascinating to speak to you because literally you are, you are the beginning of MMA to now. I mean, it's, it's, that's what you are. You are the book. Um, yes. you are the book. Um, do we need a strong Bellator to go with a strong UFC? Do we need a Pepsi with a Coke? Do we need more strength in rival organizations? I've always said this, even in the, in the beginning. Um, I said the only way that the UFC is ever going to reach its peak, and, 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 and a lot of people go, what are you talking about? Man, those guys are like on top. They would do it all. But I don't think it's really reached that level yet. And I think when it does, it'll be when we have several competitors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> excuse me bless you yeah i hope you're not developing that coronavirus <laughs> no um i get these uh hay fever i'm really bad but plus because my nose has been broke so many times man i just have bad hay fever and stuff so i'm good trust me i'm too tough to catch the coronavirus now you'll get everybody on there going oh he doesn't believe he's this is he's that no i still respect it <laughs> and I do wear a mask. I do wear a mask. You got yeah. to. You got yeah. to. Um, yeah. look, I'm going to put my blue shades on for uh, my blue glasses on for the last couple of questions. There you go. Uh, yeah. Um, what have you not done in your life that is still burning in you that you want to do? Um, I don't. You know, and I think that's the good thing with being comfortable is, is I don't think I have not done what I wanted to do. I think I've lived a pretty fast life. I think I've been able to accomplish everything I set out to do. Um, but I think that now for me, I think it's more about um, education. I think I want to educate people, uh, have a voice to be able to help others achieve their goals, have platforms um, that I can build to have other people achieve their goals and be able to watch them do that. Because I know that, you know, um, in the next five, eight years, um, you know, that window for me, even competing at where I'm competing at now is all gonna kind of close down. Um, so I wanna be able to enjoy watching others because I love it so much. Uh, I, I mean, I have a hard time walking away from fighting as people know because I have such a love for it. But if I can stay close to it, if I can be a part of it and watch other people achieve those same goals, achieve those same adrenaline rushes, then I will feel the same thing because I know what they're feeling. So for me, I think that's probably what I want to do most is be able to help other people find, it, find out what it is they want to do and help them achieve it. Nice, that's a beautiful message. Well, how about coming when when we can travel, when the air bridge from the UK to America is working again. How about you and I do a tour on stage in the UK as well? Well, I'd love to, man. That'd be great. Be awesome. Love to. And also, too, when we announce the Valor BK, our next show, when we announce our next show, because we're going to be doing other, a lot of other things to build the next show, which will be after probably 2021 when this thing, everything lifts and we start getting fans back in and all that. Uh, we want to do another one, and we would love to have you there and report on it, have some fun. be an exciting time because I truly believe that's the next big event. ValorBK.com. Come check out our Valor Bare Knuckle. Um, that's on our online site, so come check it out, man. You, you versus um, Hoist Gracie Bare Knuckle. Uh, Hoist would never do that. Listen, I, if I was Hoist, I would never do that, man. He's a, he's a, he's a <laughs> tremendous <laughs> grappler. He's a tremendous grappler, man, and that's where he needs to stay. <laughs> Respectfully. Respectfully, exactly, <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so, Lord Ken Shamrock, as, you, as I see you, oh, it's man. been an absolute pleasure chatting with you this afternoon and um, can't wait to see you in the near future. Look after yourself. Thank you so much for joining me. 
Go ahead, listen, I appreciate you and all the fans out there. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Check out my podcast, kinshamrock.com forward slash podcast. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you, man. Stay safe. Cheers.